Hey guys, today we're going to take a look at the EG4 server rack battery from Signature Solar. This is a 48 volt, 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. It's rated for 7,000 cycles at an 80% depth of discharge with a design life of 10 to 20 years. This is becoming one of the most popular choices for solar energy storage in the off-grid and solar power community. So this will be the usual review, testing, and teardown video. So hopefully in the future we can build out a system or two with this battery. I do have an idea in mind, but it is a month or two away and I don't want to spoil the details just yet. So as I've mentioned, this is a server rack battery. That means it's designed to fit in a server rack or a telecom style uh, rack mount enclosure. And of course you don't have to use it that way. Uh, but the measurements of this are 17.4 inches wide, 6.1 inches high, and 18.5 inches in depth. At 6.1 inches in height, that makes it just under a 4U size enclosure. And basically a U or a unit is a measurement of space in a server rack. And then lastly, this weighs in at 101.4 pounds. So taking a look at the front here, we have our positive and our negative terminal. We have these little plastic covers that come off just for added safety and protection. And these are M8 screws here. You can see we have a flat washer and a split lock washer. And down further here, you can see the circuit breaker. This is Chint brand CB-125A. And this breaker does carry a DC rating. Additionally, we have what appears to be either a shunt trip mechanism on the side, or it could be an auxiliary switch. It might be the on-off switch for the BMS. Um, we'll find that out when we open up this enclosure. Moving to the lower right side of the battery here, we can see our BMS. So we have a reset button. We have two RJ45 connectors, which use the RS485 communications protocol. We have a series of DIP switches for your addressing on the RS485. We have a run LED, an alarm LED, and a four LED state of charge indicator. And that's pretty much all there is to see externally. So I have here an Ames charger. This is a 36 or 48 volt charger. Uh, you see me use the 1224 volt on several of my videos already. Signature Solar does sell a 48 volt charger specific for their EG4 batteries. However, I very much like the 1224 volt Ames that I had. Uh, so I just went and purchased the 48 volt version. This will actually be the first time I've used the 48 volt version. So we'll go ahead and turn the circuit breaker on and turn the charger on. <laughs> All right, so it took me quite a bit uh, to get this Ames charger working. Apparently on the 48 volt version, there is a selector switch here near the fan for whether this is 36 or 48 volts. Um, the original 1224 volt charger is auto sensing, but apparently the 48 volt version is not. Uh, so if you run into a problem where this charger will not charge, make sure that switch is set correctly. It took me about 15 minutes to figure that one out. So now we can turn on our charger and we're seeing about 19.2 amps in. So I've got my typical capacity testing set up here. That is the battery is going through a uh, Batrium shunt, which is transmitting data wirelessly to this display. We have the current voltage, amperage, wattage, discharged amp hours, and discharged watt hours. Uh, so that battery is connected up to my MPP Solar LV6548 inverter, which then goes down to my space heater I've used in other capacity tests, which should put approximately a 970 watt load on the battery. All right, so circuit breaker on. The inverter started up and you can see we're at 55.15 volts. Just waiting for the AC power to engage. There we go. Uh, so that's putting approximately an 18 amp load on the battery. Uh, so we'll be back when the test concludes and we'll see what our measured capacity is. And we finished our test at 102.82 amp hours or 5.2 kilowatt hours. So that is actually a little bit over spec which is great to see. Alright, so now it's time for the fun part. This battery should be super easy to open. I see there are a series of Phillips screws going around the perimeter of the case here. Oh, look at that! Uh, so on the bottom of the steel lid there is a piece of insulative plastic just to prevent contact with uh, this metal lid from touching the terminals of those cells. Look how cleanly done and organized this is! Everything is laid out perfectly. The wires are all labeled. You can see the, the series connections there. That must be a temperature sensor T3. It's all bundled straight down the center of the cells here. And look at the size of these conductors. This is four gauge silicone insulated wiring here. It's huge. It's almost the size of my index finger. So it is interesting how the piece of four gauge then splits off into 
uh, two pieces for the ring terminals here for the battery connections both on the negative and on the positive over here as well. I am kind of curious how they made that happen but this is done so well I don't really want to rip it apart. It looks like there is a hex uh, shaped clamp in there um, so I assume that's probably just like a butt splice and they've got the number four going in one side and then two smaller gauge wires coming out the other. Uh, so it actually looks like this is constructed of two separate modules. So we have eight cells in series and then a second block of eight cells in series at the top here. And we can see these two blocks are then wired in series with this flexible bus bar here to create 48 volts. Now they do sell these modules, these 8S individual packs, on their website you can buy separately if you want. So it looks like what they've just done is taken two of those modules and put them in the enclosure. Uh, now this is a 48 volt battery and there is a lot of exposed metal here. So there is a risk of being shocked like if I were to touch straight across here. For those reasons I don't recommend people open these batteries up. Uh, but before I proceed, I am going to remove this series connector over here just to reduce the overall voltage on these battery packs. And before I do that, I also remove the balance lead connector from the BMS uh, just to avoid any unintended voltage spikes uh, that could possibly occur when I remove that series connection. Uh, so with that series bus bar removed, you can see how they have these built. Um, these, these tabs here for the series connection are actually laser welded onto the post of the cell. Uh, and then they have these two screw holes where that bus bar is sat across. And they have a very similar thing done with the series connections here between every cell. So these uh, aluminum strips are laser welded onto the posts of the battery. There's a hump in the middle here just to aid on uh, some tension relief of these terminals if the batteries were to expand or contract either naturally or through unintended means. And they have two plastic straps holding this pack together. There is a little bit of tension on it. I wouldn't call it compression. I would call it more just you know, holding the pack in place, fixing the batteries into place. Um, I also see they do have plastic spacers between every single cell. You can see them here on the corner, and you can also see them up here. There's a little plastic tab sticking up the center. Again, the balance leads are all individually labeled. We have a ring terminal covered in heat shrink, and then we just have a screw holding the balance lead into the bus bar itself. All right, so looking at the QR code of these cells, these are GFB brand cells, 100 amp hours. And as expected, these all appear to be brand new as far as I can tell. So these do appear to be the exact same cells used by SOK in the SOK batteries. Uh, however, it was pointed out to me in prior video that there are actually two variants of this GFB 100 amp hour cell. I do have an SOK battery over here. and I just want to compare the QR codes to see if these are the same or not. So here we have 0ALCBA09-1000D. And over here we have 0ALCBA09-1000D. So I think we can say conclusively that these are the same cells that are used in the SOK battery. Uh, so I also did note that this has four temperature sensors. Uh, so we can see the second connection here which goes into the uh, BMS is labeled T1 through T4. And those four sensor locations are T1, T2, uh, T3 and T4. So all four temperature sensors are bolted down to the bus bars of the series connections. Uh, so there are three large Phillips screws on each side. And by the way, this is where you would mount the bracket to connect to the server rack. Uh, they do include a bracket. These three screws are used for that. And then I also feel on the bottom here, there are three screws going across there. So I'm going to remove all nine of those screws, and then hopefully this panel will flip down and we can take a look at our BMS. And with all of those screws removed, I see this panel is loose. The size of this wiring is just incredible to me. I don't know if I've seen any other batteries that were designed with number four wire like this. Uh, they're usually like a pair of number eights or a number six or something, but the main positive that comes off the battery, it goes directly into the top of the circuit breaker, exits the circuit breaker, and goes up to the terminal. And this does appear to be an on-off switch that is joined to the circuit breaker. Uh, so that when you turn the circuit breaker on, you're turning on both the output of the battery, the positive, and you're also turning on the BMS. In the Jacoper battery, we saw a separate switch for this. I do prefer this style, that way both are done at the same time. We can see the main negative that comes off the battery. It goes into the top of the BMS at the B- connection. Uh, and then it comes out the bottom there at the P- connection and goes over to the terminal. So this actually comes with a pre-charge resistor built in. Uh, so that when you connect a load such as an inverter, you're not like hammering your battery with the inrush current to charge the capacitors of that inverter. So taking a closer look at that, here's the model number of the resistor itself. It is EVR-60V-200W. 
uh, 10RJ. So I assume that's 60 volts, 200 watts, 10R, probably 10 ohms, uh, just my guess. Um, and then down here is the control board for the pre-charge resistor. And we can see it does say uh, pre-charge dash V1.0.1 there. And the way it appears this works is I see this lead comes off the negative before the BMS, goes down to the resistor, goes into this board, and then we have this lead coming off that goes down to the negative of the BMS after the BMS. And I can see that that then comes into these two FETs and goes out. So guessing the way this works is it probably just switches on these FETs a couple of times through this resistor to charge the output. And then I'm guessing either after a certain time period or maybe it senses voltage on the output terminals, it then switches on the power through the actual BMS. And that's actually a much larger resistor than I would have expected, a 200 watt resistor. Uh, so these must be the bleeding resistors for when we are balancing. This is a passive balance. That means it burns off the excess energy through the resistors. And the actual FET transistors for controlling the on off power are on the other side of this board. And we can see a very large heat sink down in there. So that design is actually using this entire case front, this entire steel piece, as a heat sink for the heat generated by these transistors, which is very cool. All right, so one of the last things we want to test on this battery is that the low temperature charge protection works as designed. So I've just pulled one of the temperature sensors off. This is T1. I'm going to turn on the charger and then dunk the sensor in this glass of uh, frozen water with some orange rock salt. Now this battery is programmed to shut down at negative 5 Celsius, so I'm hoping we can hit that with the uh, ice water here, but we'll see. I'm going to put a towel in here just to avoid contact with the batteries. All right, and there we go. It's shut down. I'm going to pull the sensor out now and just warm it up and see if it starts charging again. And there we go. It just turned back on. So as expected, this battery is built exceedingly well. It's no surprise that these have become so popular. And with it rated for 7,000 cycles, if you do one cycle per day, that calculates out to 19.1 years this battery is rated for. So the last thing to touch on is price. The EG4 Life Power 4, and that is the specific model of this battery. There are a few different EG4s they sell. This is the Life Power 4 model. It sells for $14.99, which calculates out to $293 per kilowatt hour plus shipping. Now, if you happen to live in or near Sulphur Springs, Texas, where their company operates, you can actually go to their facility and pick up the battery at no additional charge. If you're interested in learning more about the EG4 battery, I will leave a link down in the video description. That is an affiliate link, which does help support this channel. If you have any questions, comments, or you have any experience with these batteries that you'd wish to share, please feel free to leave those as well. Uh, don't forget to hit that like button before you go, and thanks for watching.